excited to be in uh, his presence, to learn of him and uh, of all that he has done, all that he's doing. Um, last week, we were talking about um, how we, we, we have a spirit, an unwavering spirit, and, and this must be a part of who we are, to have an unwavering spirit. How many of you know that in this life, there's so much that just seems to challenge us one way or another? It just seems like we're always being pushed here to and fro. And the, the only sure thing that we have in this life is, is God, is His Word. His Word is sure. The Bible says that it's established in heaven. And we learned last week in, in 1 Kings chapter 13 about a young man, a, a young man of God, a prophet, who had heard the Word of God. He had the word of God, and, and he took that word of God to the king, even it, as it was presented to him. And as long as he stuck to the word, he was okay. And see, and this is, there's such a powerful message in that. And then along the line, he gave the word that was given to him. He gave it to the king, to the person that that message was directed at. And as he gave it to the king, it came to pass just as he had said, just as God had spoke it to him. Now God told him, don't go the same way that you came in. If you remember, we were talking about this. Don't leave the same way that you came in, but take a different route out. And so as he took that different way out, there was an older prophet that his sons, I guess, were there. They heard what was happening at this time when he was speaking these things. And so they took another way out. He took another way out. He caught up with him, said, oh, come on back to my house. He says, because there, is, there are some things that, that, that I want you to sit down, want you to eat, drink, sit down with me. And he said, I can't, because the king even offered this to him. And he said, I can't do that because God's word was, get in, give the word, and then leave. And he, and, and he says, but I'm a man of God also. Remember the story? I'm a man of God also. I'm a prophet of God and an angel of the Lord spoke to me. An angel spoke to me and told me, and this is out of 1 Kings chapter 13. You can read it on your own time or go back to listen next Wednesday, last Wednesday's message. But he said, I'm a man of God also and God spoke to me that you're to come to my house and you're, gonna, you're to sit down and eat and drink with me. And, and because he was a man of God and said that he had heard uh, from God, from an angel of God, he went unto the, to, to the old prophet's house. And, and as the Bible says, when he was sitting there, he had disobeyed the, the word that was given to him. Can I tell you this? A word once spoken remains. God's word is true. It will always remain true. It has never changed and it will never change change. God's word is true. And for you and I that, that have this word of God, this book, this word doesn't change. And so God didn't change his mind in the middle of it. God didn't say, oh, well, you know what? I've changed my mind all of a sudden. God, the Bible says, changes not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. That's why it's so awesome to have that that, that place in our life as believers, we can always go to Christ and we know what we're going to get. We don't have to worry about, did he wake up on the right side of the bed this morning, right? We don't have to worry about, is, is he in a good mood today? No, because he's the same. He never changes. And that's the beautiful thing about God. Finally, something in this life we can go to, someone we can go to who does not change. It's, it's always nice to have that because as a child, we saw that a lot in our parents. Now, our parents may have changed a, a little bit here and there, but they were a sure place for us to run. We get in trouble. Something went wrong. It didn't matter where we were. The one place we wanted to be was we wanted to be with our mom or our dad. Why? Because that brought us assurance because we knew that we were going to be loved. We knew that we were going to be accepted. And so that's where we wanted to be. Now, the beautiful thing about Christ is Christ, God is not a man that he should lie. He doesn't change like us. He doesn't, he doesn't one day in, one day out, one day I love you, one day I don't. Every time we go to him, he's the same. And that's the beautiful thing. Well, the young prophet learned this, but he learned it the hard way. 
And so he had had the word of God. The Bible says that he went back to the man's house. And in the middle of it, the, the older prophet finally actually received a word from God because the Bible says that he lied to him. And then when he did receive it, he says, because you went back on the word that you received in the first place. Because you changed your mind on some things. Can I tell you this? As a, as a child of God, as a, as a believer... I was, I was sharing this with my wife even this past week. I, I, said, I said, this scripture so, so helps me. The story in 1 Kings chapter 13 so helps me. And it helps us as believers for this purpose. You see, when we have the word of God, the word of God never changes. You and I have been given this book. And we can read it. We can go to it. And we can learn, read from it, understand it. If somebody teaches us or tells us something that's, that doesn't line up with this book right here, with this word, then we don't have to believe it. And here's the beautiful thing about being a pastor and having the word of God. Because it's, it's, it's good to get counsel. And the Bible teaches us to get counsel. And it's good to get counsel from older, older people, older ministers, if I'm, if I'm a minister, uh, parents, grandparents, and, 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 and it's good to get counsel. But, but here's the thing, when, when we are, are studying the Word of God, the Bible says that His Spirit will bear witness with our spirit. So, so the beautiful thing is, is, if I have His Word, it doesn't matter if someone older it doesn't matter if someone wiser. See, because it doesn't matter if it's the crowd that wants to try to bring us into some other kind of a lie. If we have the Word of God, the Word of God stands. You see, and this, is, this to me is so awesome because how many of us know that we are not the smartest person in the, in the world? How many of us know that it's easy to be convinced by a crowd? How many of us know that, that, that there are people that we, might, we may look up to and, and we may revere, and so when they say something, man, it's got to be true. And even if it's not, we, we, we are inclined to believe them because, because we put them in such a, a high esteem. But I can tell you this, if you have the Word of God, this Word never changes. See, the Bible says, let him who has a dream tell his dream. But him who has my word, let him speak my word. Because my word is a hammer that breaks in pieces the rock of most stubborn resistance. And so I thank God that, it, that just as this young prophet, he had the word, he should have stuck to it. You know how many times as a young man of God, I've heard people that have been in ministry much longer than me say things that do not line up with this word and how interesting it is and how easy it would be to just believe what they say. But when I come back to the word, I have to stay with what the word of God says. Because God is not a man that he should lie. He believed the lie from the older prophet. The Bible says that because of that, on his way out, a lion took him. And it didn't devour him. It just killed him. And it didn't, it didn't devour him or the donkey that he, was with, that, he, that he was on. And the older prophet went and collected his bones. And collect his collected his body. Put it in a tomb. And was buried in that same tomb eventually. And this is why Paul says that even if an angel of light. In Galatians chapter 1. In, in verse 8, that even if an angel of light comes preaching any other gospel, that we are not to, we are not to listen, let him be a curse, Paul says. No circumstances, nothing, nobody, not an angel from heaven can alter the eternal word of God. I can tell you, you'll, you'll be tempted at times. Why? Because people will say something. Well, everybody's doing it. And it doesn't sound like a bad thing. But I can tell you this. We better be 
careful. And I encourage you, read the book of Galatians, but, but read it carefully. Read it when you have time, because Galatians is not a book that you're just going to sit there and read through. It is something that has to be devoured, taken taking apart piece by piece, parcel by parcel, and, and consumed, because there's so much in that book. But Paul says, even if an angel of light, I mean, how intimidating would that be? So James said, let us ask in faith, nothing wavering. And this has been our scripture. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. I, I want you to see something with me in 2 Timothy, because I believe that there's something so interesting right here that, that we need to, to hear and adhere to. Um, and, and because, again, I know that I've alluded to this at times, but, uh, but we're in the last days. And, it's, and, and as I said before, it's not that perilous times should come any longer. It's that perilous times are here. The, 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 the times are upon us. The Bible says in the last days, evil would be called good and good would be called evil. Right would be wrong. Wrong would be right. I, I mean, everything would be flipped on its head. And we see it all playing out. That... that that being heterosexual is, is, is just no big deal, nothing to it. It's, it's old news. And if you're, if you're the opposite, LGBT, whatever it is, that's the right thing. You argue with that. And, and we don't, we're not going to sit here. If they come into the church and they want to sit and hear the gospel, by all means, you're welcome. But don't think that we're going to change the gospel because you're here. Because as the disciples said, and as the apostles said, who, would, who should we fear, God or man? So Paul says to Timothy, he says in, in chapter 3, and I'm not going to read it, I'm just going to read a little bit of it. He says, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to parents, and ungrateful. They will... They will uh, they will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving, unforgiving, and they will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. I, I, I don't know if you, you, you hear that, but that's where we are today. And here's the thing. Paul wasn't speaking to the world because, because he even goes on and says, they will act religious. Meaning, they, they say they're a part of the church, but, but they, they're lovers of themselves. And, and so all of this. So, so we're here in these times. Now, one thing that I've been so reminded of in the last few days, because, because the attack is, is constant. How many of us feel that? That the, uh, the attack from Satan himself, from, from the enemy, is constant against you, against your mind, against your family. One, one moment, you may feel like, man, I've got this. My faith in God is strong. And it just seems like the next moment or the next day, you're just like, man, where did all that go? It just seems like one attack after another. It's like, it's like I love God and I'm going to serve God. And then the next day, it just seems like it's just hard to even pick up your Bible and read. Or it's hard to do anything. We're there. Difficult times have come. Now, Jesus says this. If you remember when he was telling the parable. And he says it for this reason. That men ought always to pray. And then he talks about the unjust judge and, and, and the... The, the woman, the, the persistent widow that wanted her cause pled. And then he makes a statement at the end of the, the whole thing. He says, will the Son of Man find this kind of faith when he returns? And see, and I find this so, so I, in, in, a, in, in a personal way, I find this so convicting. Because, because we can be on fire for God. We can be pushing in and be, 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 be going full force. I, I love God. I'm going to serve God with all my heart. But let tomorrow come. You see, this is why we don't live by feelings. We live by 
faith. This is why we don't, we don't live by our circumstances because our circumstances are always changing. We live by faith and faith in the word of God because God's word doesn't change. My feelings change. My circumstances change. And this is the kind of faith that I need. A persistent faith that stands firm in the word of God. Because everything else is changing around me. But God's word is not changing. It never changes. So James says this. But, but I think about this. Will the Son of Man find that kind of faith? Persistent faith. A person, a man, a woman who believes what God says and is willing to hold on until they receive the promise that God has made. Hmm. James says in James chapter 1 and verse 6, he says, let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. Now I want to turn back there um, in, in just a, real quickly because I want to read it right here. In James chapter 6, he says, But when you ask Him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Hear that, not in yourself, not in your circumstances, not in your emotions, not in your feelings. Not in, because, because you could really want to serve God, as we said tonight. You could really feel a stirring in your heart. I love God. I want to serve God all the days of my life. Tomorrow morning when you wake up and the enemy has, has moved in, you may feel like, well, well, is God really real? Do I really want to serve God? Do I, can I really do that? He says, make sure that your faith is in God alone and do not waver for a person with a divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. And this is the, the, the New Living Translation. And in, in verse 8 it says, their loyalty is divided between God and the world and they are as unsettled and they are unstable in everything they do. Why? Because, because again now he says that a double-minded man or, or a person whose loyalty is divided is as unsettled as a wave that is tossed to and fro in the ocean. In other words, your loyalty, I, I, wanna, I love God, but I, but I, I love the world. I want to I stay in the world. I want to do the things that I want to do. I want to do the things that, that, bring, that, that please me, that bring pleasure to me. Uh, but yet I still want to please God. And there's that real, well, you can't live in that place of a divided loyalty. So, in order to be victorious, I have to receive from God. There are some things that I have to receive from God and there are some things that I have to know. And we're going to face things in the end times, as we already read, that are worse than sickness. As we draw near uh, to, the, to, the, the, to the coming of the Lord, all kinds of spirits are going to come out against us. There's going to come evil from every side. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 27, it says that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken so that the things that cannot be shaken remain. And, and I can tell you this, the things that are seen, the Bible says are temporary, but the things that are unseen, those things are eternal. The things that are unseen, your faith, the things that are unseen at times, your, your trust in God. But, but here's the thing. And, and, I, and I love that, I, 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 and we'll get to it in just a second. But he says this, he says in verse 26 of, of Hebrews 12, his voice shook the earth when he spoke from Mount Sinai. He says, but now makes, he makes another promise. Once again, I shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God, please God by worshiping Him with holy fear and awe, for our God is a consuming fire, a devouring fire. Now, again, once again, we come back to the unmovable thing. 
The unmovable person, God, His kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and His righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. As we said, if we are double-minded or have a double loyalty, our loyalty is divided, then we're out in the world and we're here in church. And, and so our loyalty, and if we're out in the world, our loyalty to the world and, and ourself and everything else is so unstable. But the kingdom of heaven is unshakable. It doesn't move. Let the stars fall from the sky. Let the planet cease to exist. Let the world, but the kingdom of our God will stand forever. And our God will reign throughout eternity. No matter what happens, His kingdom stands. And if we are a part of that kingdom, we are as eternal as God is today. We are eternal. If, we, if we're not careful, the things that, that, that we have put our trust in will be pulled out from underneath us. Why? Because the things that can be shaken will be shaken. If you put your trust in your mind, I can tell you this, your mind can be gone in a moment. If you put your trust in your money, I can tell you this, the stock market could fall tonight. If you put your trust in any other thing than God's word, then everything that you hold on to could be shaken tonight. The Bible says that God's people perish for lack of knowledge, for lack of understanding. And there are some things that we have to know if we're going to be victorious. We, 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 we must know that these things must not be compromised. The things that, are, that, are, that God reveals to us. You see, there are some people that are, that, and preachers even, that have led themselves to believe that they can compromise certain principles because they believe that the ends justifies the means. We, we, we touched on that last week. They believe that, that, that as long as it produces the result, it'll be okay. You see, and this is where we kind of get, we, we get in all kinds of trouble. You see, you have people these days, and, and people, and preachers even, that'll preach, well, it's okay as long as you're going to get married. Mm. And so you have all kinds of premarital things going on. As long as you plan on getting, see, the ends justifies the means. You're, you can live together as long as there's a date in... in I can tell you this, the Word of God says no, so, so the answer is no. You, it's, it's not right. God is not going to bless that, that kind of a union. Uh, and, and therefore, we have to do what God's Word says, and we have to do it right. We have to do it God's way. You see, if we do what's right, right then we can receive all that God has for us. Why else would He give us His Word? Why else would He give us the plain Word of God? You see, some people say, well, 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 and, and, and don't give me, we live in a time of grace, we live under this place, we're not, we're not ruled or judged by the law anymore. Yes, but why did God give us His Word? Why does He still instruct us on these things? Because there are still some things that cannot be compromised. You see, we, we, we have to understand, first of all, we must know that the ultimate victory in the things of God is by faith. And this is, this is something that we started on last, last week, but it's by faith. There are, there are many people that will say, uh, well, we know that it's by faith. I, you know, I, I believe in God. Well, the devils believe also. And it's not doing them any good. They, they, they tremble. They shudder. Well, well I believe that God is, is, is on the throne. Well, well, the devil knows that. And, and the devil even had, had access to it. And we see that in the book of Job where he comes and he, and he oh, and, and, and you know, it's just kind of like, um, where you come from? Well, I'm just coming to and fro, just searching the earth, basically seeking someone who to, to, to devour. And God says, Has, have you considered my servant Job? And, and, and devil was quick. He says, I've been waiting for that one. He said, but you won't let me touch him. I, I haven't been able to get to him because he, and, and, and here's the thing. Why? Because Job was a righteous man. And he did those things 
that were pleasing to God. And the word of God and God protected Job. And, and you see, Satan so wanted to get to him. That was what he was hoping that God would say. Have you considered my servant Job? Oh, give me, give me one opportunity with Job and we will, we will fix him. But we know the story. We don't have time for that today. But every life achievement in the Bible is labeled with a single phrase as its keynote. And that phrase is, by faith. By faith. You see, you can't, you, you can't know God except by faith. You can't be pleasing to God except by faith. In, in Hebrews chapter 11, and you can, you can turn there. In Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible says, and, and again, it, it, you go all the way through it. It says in verse 3, By faith we understand the, that the entire universe was formed at God's command. And verse 4, By faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. In verse 5, it says, It was by faith that Enoch was taken up into heaven without dying. And, and, and then in verse 6, it explains to you and I that it is impossible, impossible to please God without faith, and anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that God exists, or that God is, and that He rewards those who diligently or sincerely seek Him. But as you continue on down that, by faith Noah, by faith Abraham, by faith Sarah, by faith, by faith, by faith. And this is the principle of God's Word, that that that. And, and it cannot be violated. The only way that you and I are going to do anything for God is by faith. You see, we, we, we a lot of times, we're, we sit around waiting for a sign. We sit around waiting for God to do something. And God's saying, I'm waiting for you to obey or to act on my word. You have the word there. Do it. That's, that's what he's saying. You want to see the power of God, then do what God says. I, I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's simple when you really think of it. I mean, how many of us just, just sit in our kitchen and, 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 and you know, and, and Mike and Marisa, some of the greatest cooks, but, but how many times have you just sat in the middle of your kitchen and wished for something to come out of the oven? It doesn't happen that way. You've got to put the ingredients together. You've got to do the work. You've got to make sure that everything is, is, is where it needs to be. Why? Because it's by faith. I, I do this by faith, and that's where I get the results. Is by faith. I obey the Word of God, and then I get what the Word of God tells me that I can have. It's that simple. Why do men find themselves in trouble? Why do people find themselves in trouble? Every answer to life is in God's Word. I can tell you this. You want to be healthy. You want to be wealthy. You want to do those things? Get in the Word of God. Read the book of Proverbs. And, and you will find that there is so much in the Scripture that if we could be diligent and disciplined enough that we would have more than enough and there would be an abundance in our life. We would live in peace. We would live in, uh, in, in harmony with our brothers and sisters if we lived by faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Don't you love the way that, that, that it says that? It, it, in, in other words, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. He, not hearing by Oprah. Not hearing by Dr. Phil, not hearing by some other person, but hearing by the Word of God. This is the one thing that has been established in the kingdom of heaven and in, 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 in all the universes. The Word of God is the one thing that stands. And this is the principle that cannot be violated. Jesus put a great emphasis on faith. He said in Luke 7.50 that your faith has saved you. Again, in Matthew 9 and 22, your faith has made you whole. In Matthew 9.29, according to your faith, be it unto you. And then in, in, in Mark 9 and 23, if thou canst, canst believe, by faith, if you can believe, all things are possible. 
It, but, but it's all by faith. And so, so we have no one to blame but ourselves. We say, well, God didn't do it. No, 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 no. Here's the thing. God loved us and gave us all things. Jesus Christ came and died for us, resurrected and ascended back into heaven and sent the Holy Spirit. God did his part. Jesus said, it is finished. It's established. It's done. And so then why isn't it working? Because we're not acting according to faith. We don't believe what God said. But I do, Pastor, I do. Do you really? You see, because faith is, again, the ability to hold on until you see that thing come to pass. You, 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 you can go on there. Faith is the confidence in verse 1 of chapter 11 that, we, that what we hope for we will actually will actually happen it gives us assurance about things we cannot see faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen according to the king james now i i, I thought about this many years ago and and this is the way that i again it it came back to me because i i just i just sometimes ponder things but when i take that word faith because faith comes by hearing what? God's word. So, so when, I, when I take that word faith and I put word in, in its place, that the word of God is the substance of things hoped for. Substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not yet seen. So what am I hoping for? I, I can look in the word of God and I can begin to read about a city whose builder and maker is God, who's 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles high, and, 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 and my soul begins to long for something I cannot see. I have the substance right here. This is the deposit on the things that are coming. See, so, so all of a sudden now I'm hoping for or I'm looking for or desiring healing. Well, I can find healing all through the scripture. So the substance of things hoped for is right here. The evidence of things not seen is right here. So I have the substance and the evidence right here in my hand. But now what I have to do is I have to put my faith into action. You'll get it. See, faith without works is is dead. Real faith works. Real faith does. Real faith moves. Without faith it's impossible to please Him. For he that comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So when I come to God seeking something from God, now I'm not talking about, okay God, and, and you have these that, that, that just asked it in, in, in a little way. No, the Bible says that Jesus learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And, and he cried out with strong crying and tears. And, and so if Jesus had to pray through, then guess what? I have to pray through. There are some things that I'm going to have to really press into and keep praying for. Why? Because I believe what God said that He is and that He is a rewarder. And God, the only reason I'm going to hold on and, and, and hold on in that manner is because He is a rewarder. He promised it. He will deliver on the promise that He made. I can tell you this. I'm not going to hold on if I don't believe that he's going to do it. And neither will you. What have you been believing God for? Well, I believe God for it, but I, I just gave up because it never happened. That's because you didn't believe that he was a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If you believed that he could do it, you wouldn't have let go of him in the first place. You would have kept pressing in. You would have said, God, not until I see it come to pass. I've got the, I, I've got the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But God, now, 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 let me see it. Let me, let me see it with my own eyes. And I'm not going to stop until I see, you come to, see it come to pass. The second thing is, by faith, not only must I see that God is almighty, but I must know that God is almighty in me. He's almighty in you. 
You see, we know that God is almighty. We know that he's, that he's a great God. We can, we can sit back like everybody else with the best of them and say, oh yeah, God created the heavens and the earth and, and all the fullness thereof. But, but, but then all of a sudden, it, it, it comes home. And, and, and here's, here's a great example. We, somebody gets sick. Well, I can believe for somebody, for somebody's healing. Man, I can pray for somebody. But when, when I'm sick... It's a little bit harder to pray. Why? Because it's coming home now. It's coming home now. You see, I can pray for your, for your lost loved one uh, to come home. I, I can pray for that. But if my loved one goes, goes you know, off, it, 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 it gets a lot more difficult to pray and to believe. You see, because now it's come home. I, I know God will do it for you. And I know God will do it for you. But will he do it for me? Is he almighty in me? And this is where it breaks down. Everybody knows that there's a God. The devil knows that there's a God. He, and, and we believe that he can do anything. All of us believe that there's a God and, and that he's almighty. We, you, you, may, you may sit in this room and say, well, I, I think God is real. I believe that there's a God. Well, well, there is a God. Whether you and I believe it or not, there is a God. And, and it doesn't change anything whether you believe or not because he's God. See, the sinner even believes that God can do anything. I've heard a lot of people that, that don't know Jesus Christ. Oh, I believe in God. I believe in God. Demons believe and tremble. When Jesus was here on the earth, the devils always recognized him and would cry out saying this in Matthew 8 and 29, Are thou come to torment us before our time? The devils saw Christ. Who did they see? They saw God when they looked at Jesus Christ. They saw God and they said, they said, are you come to torment us before our time? Like we know who you are and, 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 and you're here to torment us. See, the devil knew that God was almighty and they knew the devil knew that he had to obey him when he spoke. Why? Because he's king of kings and lord of lords. And at the name of Jesus, every knee bows and every tongue confesses. The devil hated the fact that when Jesus said something, he had to listen. You see, see some religions say that Jesus and the devil were, were, were brothers. And so they were, they were equals sitting on, sitting on the same plane. One was evil, one was good. It's like the good brother, bad brother, good cop, bad cop. But it wasn't like that. God, Jesus is God and the devil is, is, is nowhere near his level. The Bible actually says that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ and God has put all things, all things under our feet. And so even the devil is subject to us through the name of Jesus Christ. And the devil knows that. The problem is, is we don't. See, and the devil doesn't want us to come to that understanding. See, that when the man that had enough devils in him to drown 2,000 hogs said to him, in chapter 8 of, of Matthew, verses 29 to 31, he says, Are thou come hither to torment us before our time? If thou canst cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And Jesus let him go. See, they, they even had to ask his permission to get into a pig. They couldn't just go into the pig without the permission of Jesus Christ. So the devil knows the almightiness of God. Everybody out there that allows God knows the almightiness of, of God. If, if, if you are going to be victorious... You and I have to go beyond just knowing that God is almighty, but we have to know that God is almighty in us. And this is where it begins to break down. This is where Moses had trouble. Unless I know that God will do what he's, what he's promised. In other words, if, unless I know that God will do or, or perform what he's promised, I, I can't go. I can't go through with it. See, if I don't know this, then I'm going to waver. You're going to waver. Well, I know that God said this, but how many of us know that God is not a man that he should lie? How many of us know that if God said it, he will do it? 
He will perform it. That's, that's why the Bible says that God's word is established in heaven. That's why God said that he put his word above his name. And, and that, that to me is one of the most powerful statements in the word of God. He puts his word above his name. Meaning, if his word is no good, neither is his name. And if he changes his word, then his name doesn't mean a thing. And, and, and so we don't have to obey any of it. But if God said it, and he's promised that he will perform it. So that's why... When he made a covenant with Abraham, he will keep that covenant even to the end. And there are some things that God has promised that have not yet come to pass, but I can stand here as sure as you, you're in this place today and tell you that God will perform what he has promised. That book of Revelation, some of those things that have not yet taken place, they will take place as sure as we're sitting in this building tonight. See, most people fail to get healed because they don't see this. Is God Almighty in me? See, this was Moses' controversy with God at the burning bush. This is where his problem was. In Exodus chapter 3, if you have your Bible. Exodus chapter 3. I, I, you have to see it. And this is, this is what's so beautiful about the Word of God. You don't have to take my word for it. You can take his word for it. In Exodus chapter 3, in verse 10, he says, Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh, and you must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested, protested to God, Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people Israel? Of Israel out of Egypt. You see, God, I, I, I know you can deliver. Well, I'm, I'm so grateful for that. You see, and, and, and here's, the, here's the beautiful thing, but here's the naivete, I guess, if you will, of, of us Christians. See, this is one of the reasons why the Bible tells us that the fields are white unto har harvest, but the laborers are few. And so what does the Bible say? Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send laborers into the field. And so, so, so how many of us in, in here tonight know that God could turn the continent of Africa around with just a snap of his finger? Any, anyone? Amen. Amen. We know that he could. We know that he spoke the worlds and the universes into existence. We know that he can do anything. We know that he can do all things. That's what, that's what Hebrews 11 just spoke to us. But now God says to us, well, I'm so glad that you know that I can do anything. And you know what? I'm going to do it. But I'm going to do it through you. Wait a minute, God. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. See, this was Moses' issue. I know that you can deliver the Israelites out of Egypt, God. Oh, you could do it in one swift, one swift move of your hand. You could, you could deliver all of Israel out of Egypt. You could, you could take them out overnight. You could take the Pharaoh out. You could take them all out. You, you could do it. And God says, man, Moses, I'm with you. Now, I need you to do it for me. You see, our skin, they, they, our, our skin starts to get a little nervous. See, wait a minute, God. I know you're almighty, but I'm not sure if you're almighty in me. I know you can save the people in, Bud in, in, in Budapest, and, and I know you can save the people out there in, in, in the uttermost parts of the world, but I don't know if you can save them with my help through me. See, that's where everything starts to break down. See, we believe that God is almighty. And now God says, but I'm almighty in you. And see, Moses, at this moment, he didn't, he didn't jump at the opportunity. As a matter of fact, as the word says, he protest, protested to God. I, I can't do this. I'm, I, 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 all of a sudden, he started stuttering. <laughs> I, I, I can't do that. I, I can't even speak. And God's just looking at him. Stop making excuses and just do what I told you to do. 
See, this is, this is where faith, obedience to God's word. I am going to deliver Egypt, deliver Egypt, but I'm going to do it through you. Can I tell you this? God, in his power, in his wisdom, uses people to do his work. You are the answer to someone's prayer if you would just be obedient to God's word. You have inside of you the almighty dwelling within you. And if you could understand that, God could do greater things through you if you could just obey. See, we know that God delivers But I have to know that God is in me. In Philippians chapter 2, this is what he says. And and, and I love this. Philippians chapter 2, he says, starting with verse 12, he says, Dear friends, you always follow my instructions when I was with you. And now that I am away, it's even more important. And, and, And I love this because so many people... See, here's the thing. I know that I'm not saved by works. How many of us do we have to establish this whole thing again? I know that I'm not saved by works. I know that I'm saved by faith, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. And he saved me. But listen to what Paul says. The same person that fought for this and and says this. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. And and hear what he says. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. God in me. Almighty God working in me. Almighty God working in you, for it is God working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. You see, I'm tired of this whole thing of, well, I don't have to do this and I don't have to obey God and bless God and this and that. No, this is what the Apostle Paul is saying. Faith without works is dead. He's agreeing with James right here. So, so work out your salvation with fear and trembling so that others can see what God is doing in you. As they see what God is doing in you, they're going to say there's something different about you. I couldn't do this on my own. It was Christ in me. He's the one that gives me the desire. And then when he gives me the desire to do what's right, he also gives me the power to do it. The ability to do it. To will and to do God's will. It is God that is willing in me. And it is God's power in me. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God. It is no longer my faith, but it's the faith of God's Son in me, willing and doing His will. I didn't have the power to do it before I came to the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't have the power to overcome anything. I was a slave to sin. Just as you were, you were a slave to sin. And you followed your desires. You followed your... You couldn't do it. You, it well, you, you hear those that... Well, I've been smoking for 30 years and I can quit anytime I want. Well, why haven't you? Well, I did one time for two weeks. Well, well, why didn't you just keep it going? Well, I didn't want to. No, you couldn't do it. It wasn't in you to do it. There has to be something greater that overcomes that desire. And see, it is Christ in us that gives us a greater desire for, for His kingdom for him, and then he gives us the power to perform the desire that he gives us. See, your desires used to come from your old nature, and therefore they were evil desires. And you didn't need any power, but your old nature gave you the desire to go and fulfill whatever it is that you wanted to do. But now God is the one giving you desires, and God is the one giving you the power to will and to do his will. 
And it's a delight. Why? Because there's so much hope. There's so much peace in doing what pleases God. So God said to Moses, I've come down to send you to deliver my people. And Moses said, in effect, I believe that you can do it, God, but not through me. And we've told that same thing back to God. We, we believe that you are almighty. But we begin to question when it comes to us. Obedience to faith. Obedience to the faith that has been delivered to us. Moses did go. He did deliver the people of God. And the Holy Ghost recorded this. He did it by faith. See, it all came back to, comes back around to, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it by faith. Moses didn't get some supernatural power like we would see on, on the Marvel comics that all of a sudden they're endued with some kind of great, great power and they can, no, no. God said, no, you need to march into Egypt and speak my word and I will be with you, Moses, to perform my word. But what if they kill me? Glorify my name. I'll do what I have promised. See, many of you have struggled even along these lines. Problems in your home, your marriage, your body, other difficulties. You've seen God work some things in your life. But you've run up against things from time to time that just don't seem to give. They, they, they're there. And it just seems like you keep struggling. We can trace our weaknesses back to our faith. If we, if, in its purest form, we, we can, it comes right back to our faith. See, our faith is under attack. Our faith is under attack from every, from every object, from, every, from Satan himself, from every point. Uh, our, our faith is under attack. How do we strengthen our faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You see, we have to keep reminding ourselves. We have to keep reading our Bible. It's not enough to read your Bible one time and say, well, well I read my Bible. Well, good. Go back and read it again. And, and read it again and, and read it in bite-sized pieces, if you will, because it's not always just filling your mouth and not getting, well, well I, I read a whole chapter today. Yeah, but what good did, did it do you if you didn't understand it, if you didn't appropriate it, if you didn't take it and let it change you? You see, but when we begin to say, read our Bible, and we, and, and, and we say, well, well, this is what the, the Word of God says. Now, the Word of God is living. It is powerful. It is the only book that the author, every time you read it, is present with you. Why? Because He's everywhere. He's guiding you through it. You can ask Him at any time, God, I see it. I hear it. But I want it to be done in me. So see, and then it, the Bible says that he is the one that, that gives you the desire. And then he's the one that gives you the power to perform it. So the power is not of you. The power is not of me. The power is of God in me to will and to do his will. But I can't do his will. No, you can't do his will. Apart from the vine, you and I can do nothing. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, then you can do anything. You can ask the Father, he'll give it to you. My word will produce in you those things. So you've been trying to do it on your own, but you have to come to that place where you surrender to God because God will not force us. See, this is that point where we surrender and true faith is, is in humility accepting that God is in control. He's our Lord. He's our God. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. No one has to go to heaven to bring him down. And he's not a billion miles away. The Bible says he's in you. Madame Goyan, in her search after God, came to a man of prayer and she asked him about finding God in a real and personal way. And the man of God told her, you're looking without for him who can only be found within. He 
is in you if you are born again. You see, men are looking for God without when all they have to do is receive Him. And He comes in. The weakness of our faith is in our failure to boldly lay hold of the fact that Christ lives in me. I want to read this scripture in closing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I, I, I love this. I love this thought, if you will. I, I, I'm just... And I pray that it would, it would help solidify whatever it is that maybe you're struggling with. So, so, I want you to think about this. The Bible says that when you're married and, and you're joined with your partner, you become one flesh. You're no longer two, but you're one. And, and, and there's something that also happens. And, and, and here's what the scripture says. In verse 15, he says, Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a, should a man take his body, which is a part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And do you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scripture says that two are united into one. But, but hear this, what God says. This is so powerful. But the person who is joined to the Lord... Is one spirit with him. And in verse 19, if you skip down, he says, Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and who was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Here's, here's such a powerful thing. When you come and join and, and, and you're united with, with Christ, you become one spirit. All things passed away. All things become new. The slate is wiped clean. Why? Because, because what's greater? Sin or Christ? Who's greater? The first Adam, which was in the garden that fell? Or the second Adam, which was crucified, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. We know that we, we, we know. So when we're joined with Christ, we become one spirit. Now the Bible says that who knows the mind of a man except the spirit of the man. And he says, and therefore, if we have the spirit of God, we have the mind of Jesus Christ. So now here's, here's the powerful thing. If I'm a believer and you're a believer... If somebody comes and says something to you or me, they say it to Christ, not just you. If someone offends you or attacks you in any way, they're not attacking you. They're attacking Jesus Christ. And he says, vengeance is mine. And I will exact payment. Now see, this is the powerful thing. If we're one with Christ and we've been joined in one spirit, what this means is what he can do, I can do. He said, greater things shall you do than I have done. Why? Because he lives in me. After all, again, it's not me doing them. But it's Christ in me doing the work. My body is a temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives in me. And so therefore, he's just, he's just going to, I'm going to allow him to live in me. And whatever he desires to do, he gets to do it through my body, through your body. And he wants to show the world who he is through you. He wants to love the world through you. He wants to heal the world through you. He wants to show himself strong in you. See, you have to believe that not only is he almighty, but he's almighty in you. 
And his power is greater than anything that you and I could do, will do, and will ever do. And that's why we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And the Bible says that he raises us up in due time. In other words, he's going to show himself strong. He's going to show himself mighty. He's going to show himself on our behalf. And when the world looks in, they're going to say, no way, you couldn't do that. All we have to say is, I didn't do that. Christ in me, he did that. He's the one that saved me. He's the one that forgave me. He's the one that healed me. He's the one that delivered me. And he'll do the same for you if you let him. He'll be almighty in you to the glory of God. Amen. We give him the praise in Jesus' name.